I gave myself one week to take this prototype and make it a fully functioning app that people could use. Clock started Monday morning and this is what happened. So last week I built this. It's a prototype for an app called Amy, which is a calorie tracking app in the style of Apple Notes. You type the food you ate on the left and then on the right, the app is gonna search and find the calories for you. I made it in 12 hours just to experiment with some new technology. I posted it online and honestly, the response was kind of insane. I got hundreds of replies, dozens of very talented designers said that the app looked pretty cool and over 500 people ended up joining the waitlist. I have been building apps for years and I'm constantly posting concepts and project updates all the time, but the response I got for this app was very rare. And when people care this much about something, you don't let that opportunity go to waste. There was just one problem though. This was not a real app. It was just a prototype that was built in 12 hours. There's no database, there's no backend. There really were no other features aside from the one that I posted in the initial screenshot. What I decided to do to make sure that this opportunity does not go to waste was build the app and make it fully functioning in just one week. And then onboard the first set of users so I can start getting feedback. And that's what we're gonna be covering in this video. I'm gonna show you everything I did to go from this concept to actually submitting the app on test flight so that the first couple of users can start using it. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. My name is Chris and I build productivity apps and I try to document everything that I'm learning and share it with you guys on this channel. So the first thing that I did was actually stabilize the app. I did have the prototype and it looked really good. You can type things and the AI worked, everything was functional, except it really was not that stable. This is one of those things that looks really simple on the surface, but there's a lot of complex things going on behind the scenes. For example, the way I built this is it's actually two scroll views, one on the left that has the text editor and then one on the right that has the calories and they're constantly in sync. So one example of a problem that I was facing was there were some cases where those two scroll views would actually get out of sync. So I actually had to rewrite this thing a couple times. And then there were some little things like, what if you have multi-line text? How is it going to push all the other stuff at the bottom? And then obviously there were some edge cases like, what if the device went offline? What if the server had a bad response or was taking too long? So I spent the first day just trying to make sure that this core interaction was absolutely bulletproof. To be honest, the AI part was actually already solid. If you saw my last video, you know I'm using Perplexity Sonar to actually power the AI and the database search for the app. And honestly, it does most of the heavy lifting. There really isn't much I need to do in terms of accuracy here. The AI is not the hard part of this app. It's actually the UI and the UX and making sure that this is a very good experience for the user and something that they actually stick with. Nailing the core experience down to all of the animations took an entire day, but it was absolutely worth it. Day two and three, I spent working on the nutrition detail page. When I created the prototype of this app, it was really just to learn Apple's liquid glass and their foundation model. So there were no secondary pages. And this nutrition detail page, which is the page that appears when you click the calories on the right and shows you the breakdown of the nutrition, that is a very important secondary page. So it didn't exist, had to completely create it from scratch. Did use Claude Code and quickly prototyped a very basic one. But honestly, it did not look good. So I cheated a little bit and asked my fiance Cecilia to help me design a better one. So we spent two whole days trying to figure out what would make this page really good. She has a whole video on her channel breaking down the designs of this and all the iterations we did, but there was a lot of things. Like I think we tested like 15 different background colors, a bunch of different layouts. Something to highlight though was the thing we wanted to capture in this page was trust. Because a problem with a lot of these calorie tracking apps is users need to trust the data behind them, especially when the calories are being calculated manually. So the first thought was, okay, if I at least have a breakdown of the individual items and the nutrients, maybe that's enough. But I was sitting with it for a few hours I honestly didn't really trust it that much. So the next thing we added were the ability to see the sources. So these were the individual web pages that the AI looked through to get this data. That did really make a big difference and help because when I saw the nutrients, I'm like, okay, at least I know where this came from, but it still wasn't good enough. So then we added one final thing, which was this section called Amy's thought process. And this actually made a huge difference because it's a section where Amy will tell you how it came up with the calorie calculation. So if it used specific substitutes or calculated the portions in a different way, you can see the breakdown here. And this made such a big difference in terms of me trusting the data. So now every time I click on a calorie, I actually go and I read the thought process. And if I like what I see, I'm like, okay, cool. I trust the data. And if I don't, I usually then can just close out and then just re-edit it and be like, I need to be more specific with the portions or something. This was the thought process that went into this page. Our North Star here was, does it make us trust the underlying calories that it's calculating? And I actually think that it really did. Sadly, there was something we had to cut. I wanted the ability to edit the calories on this page. So I was hoping we can have a button 
button floating at the bottom where when you click it, you can then start chatting with an AI and tell it, hey, this seems a little overestimated or you use the wrong thing and it would go make edits. I did make a little bit of progress there. Unfortunately, I think it would take me probably a few extra days to make sure that this functioned perfectly. So I completely scrapped it for now from the beta. Since this is such a simple app and there's really only like three pages and this is one of those pages, it was worth it in my opinion to spend two whole days really perfecting it. And now it's a page that I absolutely love opening. The next day I decided to work on the goals feature. So something I quickly realized after just using it for a few days myself was I needed the ability to set a specific goal, whether it be a calorie goal or a protein goal or something, because right now the app is just a calorie tracker and people don't track calories just for the sake of tracking calories. They're usually tracking calories because they want to hit a specific goal. They want to lose weight. They want to gain muscle. They want to do something. So I knew that this was a very important feature I needed to have early on. Originally we have this bar at the bottom that showed the total calories for the day. Completely swapped it with a new one where when you click it, it'll show you a bunch of different bars so you can see how many calories you have left how many how much protein how much fat how much carbs you can see this in a really glanceable way now there's a new settings page where you can specify what your goal is whether you want to lose weight or gain weight or maintain and then you can set the different macronutrient and calorie targets there and i added this cool thing where if you're not sure what the targets should be you can click it and then if you answer a couple of these questions it's going to use ai and actually generate what the target should be for you still a lot of refinement on that to be honest but i was really happy with how it came out and this will also be a really important screen during the onboarding. Next, I decided to add notifications. And the reason is based on my experience building apps, notifications are a very powerful way to get people to build habits. And something like a food journal slash calorie tracking app like this, building that habit of logging is extremely important. Features super basic right now, but I decided to support the ability to get two notifications, three or five every single day. I'm definitely gonna enhance this. I'll probably let people personalize this so they can choose what time they want it, how much frequency. But this was actually really quick to implement since it's a very simple simplified version, but really glad I was able to ship this one too. Day five was working on little refinements. One of the small refinements that actually made a pretty big difference was using location in the app. You can actually turn on location in the app and the AI will now use this when it's trying to calculate calories. So what does this mean? I'll give you an example. So let's say you type in two cocktails from Laurel. It has absolutely no idea what Laurel is without the location data. And so it's probably just gonna to try to find a restaurant somewhere, or maybe it's a brand. And it's gonna use that when estimating the calories. With location data on, now I can pass this into the AI and you'll see that the results are actually way better. Let's say I'm in San Francisco and I type two cocktails from Laurel. It correctly now knows that I'm talking about true Laurel cocktail bar in San Francisco. And you can see this in the new Amy's thought process section, which is really, really cool. I think this is going to be a very big magic moment for people just like it was for me when I first saw that. So that was a really small refinement I added. Next refinement was I decided to build in dictation into the app. As I was using the app, I found myself wanting to just dictate rather than type into the app because realistically, it'll let me get way more detailed with what I'm typing. So I thought really hard about this, tried a bunch of different design patterns, and this is the one I ended up settling on. The bar where we have the goals for the user, I decided to actually put the dictation and specifically the little tick marks that appear as the volume changes as the user speaking, I decided to put it there. And to make it feel really premium, this is all custom animation. So the ticks moving as the user's talking and getting larger and smaller, completely custom. Now slow it down here, but if you look at the accept and the cancel buttons, it actually is a custom animation where the icons themselves are animating in and out. And if you're curious how I did this, I'm using Apple's SF symbols. And this is actually an animation that comes default when you use some of this stuff. It's like two lines of code. Since there's not many features in here, I needed to make sure every single interaction and animation was a home run and just felt so premium. Okay, so I know I've been talking about dictation in my own app, but let me tell you where I came up with the inspiration for this. And it's because I've been using an app called Whisperflow. If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I've been dictating absolutely everything. It is just so much faster than typing and Whisperflow is the best dictation tool that I have found. And a huge shout out to them for actually being a channel sponsor. My recommendation is to just use Whisperflow when you're dictating into my own app. But if you can't for some reason, just use the one that I built into the app that we've been talking about. I'm using Apple's native dictation library to power that dictation feature, but it's just not as accurate as something specialized like Whisperflow. Here's an example. If I say something really really quick, like chicken pad thai with no bean sprouts, you can see in my app, sometimes it has a hard time picking it up, especially if I'm speaking quickly. But if I say the exact same thing using Whisperflow, so if I say chicken pad thai, no bean sprouts, 
it perfectly gets it. It is just so much more accurate. And this is just the limit of Apple's native dictation that I'm using to power the dictation in my app. Whisperflow also lets you create a personalized dictionary of terms and phrases, which makes it way more accurate if you're using words that are not commonly used. I use it for everything, dictating into Claude code, writing emails, sending texts through their iOS app. I even write all my YouTube scripts by dictating into Claude, which saves me at least 30 minutes every single time. And it works across all apps on desktop and iOS, not just inside a single tool. I'll leave a link in the description below and there's a code for one month free on top of the 14 day trial that you already get when you sign up. They did not have to provide that code. I'm the one that asked for that. So a huge shout out to them for doing that. Location tracking and dictation. This is what I worked on on day five and they might seem really small, but I think they're gonna add up and make this a very good experience. Day six, finally hooked up a backend and database. So up to this point, if you killed the app and reopened it, all the data would be gone. Once I sorted out the UI, the UX, and I kind of figured out what data structure I wanted, I quickly spun up a database to persist the data and then a backend to go along with it. For database, I'm using a service called Supabase, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have already heard about. Here's where I'm gonna say something controversial. I actually use something called Supabase MCP, which is an MCP server you can give to something like Claude Code. So now Claude Code, which is a coding agent, has complete access to my Supabase account to spin up databases and just do everything I can do in the UI. The reason it's controversial is because it is pretty dangerous dangerous to do this. So I already know a lot of developers are going to be probably commenting, being like, why are you doing that? This is really unsafe. They are totally right. But in my opinion, I think it is completely fine to use stuff like this, especially early on when there's no real data, there's no real users, to quickly spin up and scaffold a project for you. It was able to spin up the entire database structure in about like 10 minutes. And this is something that usually takes me a few hours to do correctly. I love to use MCP database tools like this, but then obviously when the app's in production, that's when I usually stop using stuff like this or use them in just just read only mode for debugging because it does get a little more risky when you're dealing with real user data. So I try to be a little bit more careful there. In terms of the backend, it's a very simple Node Express server. So there's really not much to talk about there. There's just a few endpoints hosted there for the AI stuff. But I do want to call this out because this is something I see with a lot of people who build mobile apps is they usually build the AI directly into the mobile app. Do not do this, that is very insecure. The proper way to do this is you want to put the AI on some sort of backend service and then call that from your mobile app. You never want the front end service to call OpenAI, Anthropic, OpenRouter directly. You wanna do that through a backend service just because it is way more secure. So I took the database, the backend, hooked it up to the iOS app, and now it is basically complete at this point. I think because I've spun these things up so many times, this was really easy. So it actually took less than a day to do this. And on the final day, the last thing I worked on was the AI abuse protection stuff. Because there is AI being used here, it is very important to make sure you have protections in place before you launch this thing to real users. And that's because the stuff can get really expensive. Someone could intentionally or even non-intentionally because of a bug, accidentally rack up $10,000 in AI costs. I'll talk about some of the protections I put in place, but the big ones are I put daily, weekly, and monthly limits on each of the user's accounts, completely invisible to them. They can't see what the limits are, but there are limits there. So if for some day they try to type a thousand foods in a single day, they will get an alert saying that they hit a daily limit and to contact support. These are very reasonable limits that I don't think normal people should hit. And if they are for some reason and they reach out to me, that's really good for me to know to figure out, is there something wrong on my end or are they using it in a way that I just didn't think of? So there are those limits in place. They live on the back end, it's very secure. I also added a kill switch. So on the user's account, I can turn off the AI features completely. So if for some reason I see a user racking up a bunch of AI bills and I'm like, okay, this needs to stop. I need to figure out what's going on. I can turn it off remotely on my end and then they just can't access any of the AI functions at all. And then I add some cost tracking with Posthog LLM analytics, but I'll probably make a whole video on how I'm protecting this app on the AI front because that is a common question that I'm constantly getting. So if you want to see a video like that, please leave a comment below and I can go way more in depth in how I set all this stuff up. And that was actually the week and I submitted it to test flight and we got approved by Apple and I was able to onboard the first five beta testers. A week ago, I had this prototype with literally no intentions of building an actual app. And today we have a fully functioning app with what I believe are really good features. And we have five users actually onboarded and using this thing right now. I think this is a pretty rare opportunity. So I wanted to make sure, even though I am working on a bunch of stuff to make time this week to try to iterate and progress on this app. And thankfully I was able to do it. Next step is to get the feedback from these five beta testers and then hopefully onboard the next hundred beta testers. So if you haven't joined the waitlist yet, the link in the description for that below. And we're gonna keep iterating on this app. We're going to try to figure out what the 
pricing is supposed to be, we're gonna try to get our first paid users, and I'm very excited to take you guys along with me. If there's something specific you want me to cover, please leave a comment below. And if you like this kind of content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I'm posting almost every other day about building this app specifically. So there's a lot of cool stuff behind the scenes on my Instagram page. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.